Are you sure about that? <laughs> Sometimes the words just don't come out right. You know what I mean? The message to from to, oh boy, see what I said? <laughs> John 14, 1 through 4. <laughs> Do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. My Father's house has many rooms. If that were not so, would I have told you that I'm going there to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me, that you also may be where I am. You know the way to the place where I am going. Amen. I know I haven't missed church, but I've made that flight and everything. It was good. Let's start with prayer. Father in heaven, we thank you and praise you that we have the opportunity to come and worship you freely, Lord, to hear your words, to apply them to our hearts, to listen to the Spirit, so that we may walk in step with the Spirit, to have the gifts that the Spirit gives us and produce fruit of the Spirit, Lord. For you've left us in this world to travel through this world until we reach the other side. So we meet Jesus face to face. May we be ambassadors in this foreign land. May we be like Christ in this world. We just thank you and praise you for all the wonderful things that you do. The fact that you have loved us so that we can love you and love others. And we pray this in the precious name of Jesus Christ. Amen. So I entitled this Destination or Journey. And I forgot about somebody reading the scripture. But we read scripture from John chapter 14 verses 1 through 4. What is your destination? I say that because when we went to um, Georgia and Florida several weeks ago, I guess it's been six or seven weeks now, we took the grandkids and we told them they could not say, are we there yet? Because, man, that gets long, even if you go here to Spokane. Can you imagine traveling hard three to four days with them? Three days meant that we had to get 850 miles under our belt each day if we did it in three days. I don't remember what we did. I do remember this. We drove out Sunday night and made it to Billings, Montana, and I shut down because I was exhausted. And I said, we're going to just catch us some sleep right now because I don't want to be driving this next stretch to Sheridan, Wyoming, because there's not much there. I don't want to be driving it at 3 a.m. Well, guess what? I still drove it at 3 a.m. Because about, we've sat down about 1 or something like that. I don't remember. At about 2.30, I move around just in the driver's seat. And I'm like, oh, I'm in pain. And I look in there, Sherry, like this. I'm like, you want me to start driving, don't you? She's like, mm-hmm. So I get a couple coffees, and we hit the road. But anyway, we told them that they couldn't say, are we there yet? So clever as my oldest granddaughter is, she figured out, and she likes these bigger words. She said, are we to our destination yet, Pops? <laughs> So that became funny because then Isaac picked it up. We did our destination, and they all giggle. Destination, he <laughs> and they just giggle. But I ask you that because I ask you what your destination is. You saw the, you heard the songs, you saw, saw the lyrics, read the lyrics of where our destination is. This is not our home. If you've been born by the blood of Jesus Christ, you are just traveling through, and you have a mission, and you have a purpose. Not to live your lives for yourself, because your life has been bought with a price, the precious blood of Jesus Christ. It is not your own. And so many Christians don't understand that. They just think they're saved, and they can go about life as it is. You have to live as though you know where the destination that you're headed is. You have to fix your eyes on things above or you're going to waste your life living for the things of this world. Doesn't mean you're they're not part of this world. Doesn't mean you don't enjoy the things of this world. It means you don't live for them. You keep your eyes on the destination. And you've been reading numbers, so you know what happened to the children of Israel. You know that they were taken out from the oppression of Egypt, and yet they longed to go back because of the comforts and things they had, because they saw the mighty finger of God save them even from death, part the waters and walk through on dry ground to the other side, and they rejoiced, saying that God would take us all the way. But then they started mumbling and groaning and longingly looking back, and our story goes on and on and on. 
<clears throat> but I got a question for you. Is it all about the destination or is it also about the journey? May 4th's devotional says, Jesus is king. I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under earth and in the sea and all that is in them saying to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb be blessing and honor and glory and mighty forever and ever. Revelation 5.13. We're re we finished reading Revelation this week also. The devotional says the Bible makes it very clear that history is moving purposely towards a definite conclusion. And if you don't understand it, history can also be his story. Because even though you plan out your footsteps, God is the one that directs you and hopefully will direct you all the way home if you keep your faith in Jesus Christ. That reality is one of the distinctive features of the biblical worldview. One way that Christianity distinguishes itself. In other words, in other words, is in the matter of how all things come to a close, our destination. Every single person is included in Revelation's picture of history. No one is missing from the story, and when history does come to a close, it will end in division and separation. Those who believe on Jesus will be set apart from those who do not. No one will be left out, though tragically some will have chosen to be shut out. Jesus is king, and he is seated at the right hand of the throne, although many do not yet recognize his kingdom. It does not alter the reality that Jesus reigns. The earthly city, the city of man, is destined to pass away, but the heavenly city, God's kingdom, will go on forever and ever. Do we recognize Jesus as king? If Jesus is your king, then you will live as his subject, seeking to obey him, even when his command cuts against your own preferences. If Jesus is your king, you'll be loyal to him above all others, for this world is not your home, and you are just passing through. Did you read that this week? Do you understand it? Do you live that way? At Sherry's, funeral, Sherry's dad's funeral, I had the privilege of doing the opening remarks. I didn't know I was going to be doing it until I got there, but it was Buren, that's her dad's name. It was his request that I speak. He was proud that his son-in-law became a pastor. He, he, we were able to spend some time talking about you know, things that the Bible said and everything else, but it was a privilege and an honor that he wanted me to speak. But I didn't know it at first, so that night I sat and wrote many sermons in my head from about 4 o'clock when I woke up till the time I got up. But then I went to Walmart early in the morning, and I said, well, let's see if they have this that I can use and explain a little bit. And I got this, this little motorcycle. And I talked about motorcycles. Yep, that's what I talked about. Because most of the people that were there were associated with motorcycles because of Buren, because he owned the motorcycle dealership since 1977. And if you know a lot about my story, which is his story, Sherry and I even came to meet because of motorcycles and so forth and so on. But I was brief, can you believe that? And I just talked about the journey that we start on through life. And the things that go in our way, and in this case, when Buren's life, a lot of it involved motorcycles. And what we do along the way, I remember a slogan from the 70s said, you meet the nicest people on a Honda. <laughs> Buren was known by the people that were older as having the Yamaha shop, because that was his first franchise. But he had many franchises now, or he still does today. And along that way, we encounter many people, face many things together, but we don't fix our eyes on this. We fix our eyes on where we're going, the destination. And I talked about the destination and opened up the services. Where is your destination? Where are you going? I had complete confidence in the fact that I was at peace because Buren was at peace because he knew Jesus Christ as his Savior. He talked about it. He lived a life that showed it. What are you doing to tell others about Jesus as you journey along through this life? When we were at the viewing, I talked to many people that I hadn't seen in 20 years, and we talked about some of these motorcycle events and stuff, and we talked about Buren, and we talked about God. I wound up talking more about God than anything because they knew I was a pastor now. 
But you don't have to be a pastor to speak about the one who saved you and with the change that he made in you, the new creation that you are in Christ. You use every opportunity to talk about Jesus and to show others that you are a child of God. What I said, it was life is a journey. And Buren had 96 plus years. Wow. But we also don't know if we have tomorrow. So we have to live each and every day as today were our last. As it was the last opportunity that you had to tell someone else about Jesus. That you, the last day that you had to show a loving act of kindness. Jesus said not to let the sun go down. Not to bring your gift to the altar without making up with your brother or sister. It's that important. His life was very long. His life belonged to God. Your life belongs to God. Every single breath. So are you living for Him? And if you're a Christian, you've got to put into the fact that your life is not your own and that you have this new life. And then how do I do that except that it's a daily denying myself and taking up my cross and following after Jesus that I have to saturate with my, his, his life with my word. I have to pray. I have to seek His will. I have to walk and step with the Spirit. I have to realize every single day that my life is not my own. It is His. What do you want me to do, Lord? Because I've got all my plans for today. Oh, but wait a minute. What are yours? So as Jesus, the last night that he, that he would be alive before he laid down his life, he said to his disciples, he said, Don't let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. My Father's house has many rooms. If that were not so, would I have told you that I am going there to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me, that you also may be where I am. You know the place where I am going. Do you know the destination? Because if you do, you're going to live this trip that you're taking differently. You cannot live it the same. You don't worry about the things of this world. You don't live for the things of this world. You still do the things in this world, but you live for the kingdom. You live as foreign as aliens in this world. And think back to the wilderness. What in the world was going through the mind of the children of God? But wait a minute, Lord. What in the world is going through my mind? You know what, I might rather be in the wilderness so I could focus more on you than be distracted by the other things, by the, the things that entangle and the sins that, that, that keep me down. Because these other things entice and fight at me. We fight a spiritual battle and they wage for my soul and so that I will be ineffective for the kingdom of God. So I've got to realize that each and every day that my life is not my own and but the power that I live this life is not by my own power or by my own mind. It's Jesus living through me. I know the destination. I know the place that I'm going. And I know that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. So I have to do that every single day. The song we sang, Footsteps of Jesus. Did you listen to the words? It says, Sweetly, Lord, we have heard thee calling. Come, follow me. That means I'm following somebody to the destination. We'll put a destination over here. How's that? Okay, we'll get us a destination. By the way, that's heaven, if you don't know. And by the way, we already mentioned that there'll be a separation. Many people that think they're going to be there will say, Lord, Lord, we did mighty deeds in your, in your name. We even cast out demons. And he'll say, depart from me, I don't know you. There's no pleading your case then. You're either following Jesus all the way there or you're going to miss it. And there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Don't look at the things of this world. Look to Jesus. Fix your eyes on Him and throw away anything that stops you from following after Him. Sweetly, Lord, we've heard Thee calling. Come, follow me. And we see where the footprints are following, falling, leading us to Thee. Then at last when on high He, we, he sees us, our journey's done. We will rest where the steps of Jesus end at His throne. Are you sure that you know the destination? Because if you know the destination, you know the journey, and you know what you're called to do. The Israelites knew it, but they didn't want to do it. They wanted to moan and groan and complain and create other gods and even commute mutiny and say, let's pick new leaders to lead us back to Egypt. But that is just ludicrous. What in the world do you think would happen to you when you went back to the land where, where you took and plundered and killed, killed their men and women and children? You didn't, the Lord God did. What do you think they're going to do when you come back there? 
And when we did youth group, so many children or teenagers said, I know what you're saying and I, and I believe it even, but I'll have to change my life the way I'm traveling if I listen to you, if I accept Jesus. So I'll just accept the other alternative because at least my friends will be there. Whoa. Have you heard his call? Have you answered? Then are you following? Because life is a journey to one destination or the other. Many will profess, but few follow. I did talk about motorcycles. I talked about our earthly life. I talked about times that we remember and enjoy, and so did the other pastors. But I talked about the hope that I knew that Buren had so that I hoped that they would see the hope that we both have. The way of the cross leads home. I must needs go home by the way of the cross. There's no other way but this. The way of the cross leads home. Jesus said, if anyone wants to be my disciple, if anyone wants to come and follow me, you have to be a disciple of Jesus. If anyone wants to be my disciple, he must, has to, deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. And anyone who does not do this is not fit for the kingdom of heaven. Do you know the destination? Are you on the right journey to the right destination? We think about it in earthly travels. I thought about it when I was flying and stuff, and the slogan of Delta is like something like this. I might be wrong on it a little bit, but it's not just the destination. It's also the journey. It is. But I guarantee you that I'm going to get on the right plane. <laughs> when we came back, I was so afraid I was going to miss that right plane because we're sitting there in Atlanta, and I'm fretting, but I'm not because I'm like, God, you're in complete control, and that just makes it so much better because time's just ticking away, and we got 45 minutes layover before we catch the next plane and here we leave Atlanta about 50 minutes after we were supposed to depart so we're five minutes behind that plane leaving and we got there we're at the back of the plane because we didn't pay the extra money to pick our seats we're not even sitting together because it's another way to that's a different story we won't even go there <laughs> we walk off the plane and I hear we're closing the doors for the flight to Kalispell that's where we flew out of and I looked up, and there was the flight to Kalispell. And I said, hold on. And we went in the door, and they shut it. God's grace. Do you see it each and every day of your life? Or do you grumble and complain and longingly look back or longingly put your trust in other things? Do you put your faith in Jesus Christ and in Him alone? Paul tells the church at Corinth, and he's already had several times that he's talked to them about the issues in the church. In 1 Corinthians 9, verse 24, Do you not know that... In a race, all the runners run. All of them. And you compete as a team. You're, you're supporting your country. This is the type of games that he's talking about. I ran cross country. And I had to comp compete. I had to run my hardest. But I had to compete with others to run, to win for the school. Do you not know that in a race, all the runners run, but only the one gets the prize? Run in such a way as to get the prize. Everyone who competes in the games goes into strict training. They do it to get a crown that will not last. But we do it to get a crown that will last forever. Therefore, I do not run like someone running aimlessly. I do not fight like a boxer just beating the air. No, I strike a blow to my body and make it my slave so that after I have preached to others, I myself may not be, may not be disqualified for the prize. Going on to the next chapter, 1 Corinthians 10, For I do not want you to be ignorant of the fact, brothers and sisters, that doesn't mean you're dumb. That just means that you don't know the knowledge. I don't want you to be ignorant of the fact, brothers and sisters, that our ancestors were all under the cloud and that they all passed through the sea. They were all baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. They all ate the spiritual, same spiritual food and drank the same spiritual drink. For they drank from the spiritual rock that accompanied them, and that rock was Christ. How much plainer can you get it in Scripture? But you also know that out of the generation that left Egypt, only two entered the promised land. Now their children did because that promise is there. God is faithful. 
but the rest of them died in the wilderness along the way to never see their destination. We have such a more glorious destination than the promised land where the spies go in and bring out a grape cluster that two people have to carry on their shoulder. It's that big a grape cluster. That's the fruit of this land that, that God is giving them where he gives them houses they didn't build and vineyards they didn't, they didn't grow. But instead they said, oh, we can't make it except for Joshua and Caleb. Wow. Verse 5 of 1 Corinthians 10. Nevertheless, God was not pleased with most of them, and their bodies were scattered in the wilderness. You should have read Numbers chapter 7 through 25. I didn't take my devotional with me. So I texted Sherry at first and said, what am I supposed to read? And I just put numbers. So I'm reading numbers long. It's got about 40 chapters. I don't know. So I have read much further. I have read all the way to Wednesday because I kept reading numbers and kept reading numbers. And I'm like, this is a lot more reading than normal. So I don't want to hear you say there's too much because I read till the next week, middle of next week. So I've, I've got all of that read for us. Chapter 36, I've got it down here. So I read, what, an 11, another 11 chapters. God's children have been saved through the water, like the Scripture said. They've been led into the wilderness. And don't forget why God led them into the wilderness. He led them into the wilderness so that they could worship Him, which means sacrifices, which means doing without, which means trusting God. He was creating a children that Walt talked about, the Leviticus talks about, holy, set apart, so that others can see who you are as you travel through this world to your destination and hopefully want to come and join the journey with you. Oh, you know what? People will. It'll happen. You may not know it in this world, but eventually there'll be people that join you along the way. Oops. We'll get to that later. We'll put on the full armor of God later. We'll just leave him now to not have armor. So you can see my little analogy about motorcycles. And we talked about those times, but those times talked about, I want you to make this trip that I'm going on forever. We did have some good times there. Vance, we had some good times when we went to Colorado and went riding, but you know what? I want you to be in heaven with me. Let me tell you about Jesus. That was the whole purpose of God creating this people as he went into these lands to show them he had already passed judgment. He will pass judgment. But there would be some like Rahab, the prostitute, that said, I will follow Jehovah God. We're to be a light to the world. But instead, they longingly looked back. Numbers is a counting, a counting of every single person that God pulled out of the land of Egypt and gave them the promised land. But if you'll notice in Numbers, there's more than one counting. Because he counted it first, and those didn't go to the promised land because they shut themselves out, not because God wasn't faithful. They vowed to holiness, but look how they lived. Now look at yourself and see how you live your life. Don't stand too firm in case you fall. We're only going to make it to chapter 21 today. Numbers chapter 7 through 10, everyone contributed. The tabernacle was finished. Everyone did their part. They were all set apart, made holy for God. We pick up in chapter 10 through chapters, chapter 11. We, uh, we read in verse 11 of chapter 10, On the twentieth day of the second month of the second year, the cloud lifted from above the tabernacle of the covenant law. Then the Israelites set out for the desert of Sinai and traveled from place to place until the cloud came to rest in the desert of Paran, or wilderness. They set out to go to the promised land. But you have a little bit of wilderness at first. Every once in a while you might crash. Or you might run out of gas. Or you might even lose your way. But you know what helps is when you teach others, they can come along. That Don't let him crash too. And help you find your way to get back on path. That's why we need each other. That's why we're given different spiritual gifts. Because they were all headed to the same destination, the promised land. But in Numbers chapter 11, we read about grumbling, complaining, and a longing for meat instead of bread. 
And Jesus is the bread of life, isn't he? In John 6, the people complained. And Jesus said, you only came because you want your bellies full. You only see the physical. And he had to even had, had to ask his disciples, he said, are you going to leave me also? And Peter said, no way can I leave you because you have the words that lead to life. Do you realize that? Are you headed in the right direction? They gorged themselves with so much meat. There were over a million Israelites and quail flew in enough to feed all of them. I cannot even imagine that. The skies must have been darkened, and there must have been birds laying everywhere. I, I can't even fathom that. And what they do, they just gorge themselves on it instead of fixing their eyes on the promised land, on what God would give them. And many died and were buried there. Joshua is mentioned for the first time in Numbers. And even he, in his zeal, lacks vision because he doesn't realize that a couple of guys are prophesying and Moses says, let them prophesy. <laughs> to whoever the Spirit gives the gift to, let him. Jesus said something similar. But yet he had enough vision, he had enough faith that he would lead the people in into the promised land. Spoiler alert if you don't know it. In verse 25 of Numbers 11, Then the Lord came down in the cloud and spoke with him, and he took some of the power of the Spirit that was on him and put it on 70 elders. When the Spirit rested on them, they prophesied, <clears throat> but did not do so again. You have the Spirit of God living inside of you. And Paul said, don't argue over who has the gift of tongues, but pray for the gift of prophecy, that you can understand this Scripture so that when the opportunity comes, you have exactly the right words to say. They won't be your own. However, two men whose names were Eldad and Medad had remained in the camp. They were listed among the elders, but did not go out to the tent. Yet the Spirit also rested on them, and they prophesied in the camp. A young man ran and told Moses, Eldad and Medad are prophesying in, in the camp. Joshua, son of Nun, who had been Moses' aide since youth, that's why we train up our children, spoke up and said, Moses, my Lord, stop them. This destination is for all. This journey is for all of us to go. And if he starts prophesying instead of me, praise God that he's been listening to the Spirit. Right? Whoever is with me will gather. Whoever is against me will scatter. Are you with Jesus? Numbers 12, Aaron and Mir Miriam even oppose Moses. They're opposing God. And if you look, they, they do it based on prejudice and racism. How sad that we get caught up in things like that in this world. Moses intercedes, but you see that he even struggles with power and faith, and he strikes the rock instead of speaking to it. Numbers 13, they're two years into their journey. They go send some of the elders in to the explorer of the promised land that God will give them. Verse 1, the Lord said to Moses, Send some men to explore the land of Canaan, which I am giving the Israelites. From each ancestral tribe, send one of its leaders, the one who is supposed to be leading the people, because they're listening to God and they have faith in God, and they're spending time with Him every day, and they're satisfied with what God gives them in this world, because He knows He's taken them to a better place. So with the Lord's command, Moses sent them out, into the de out of, from the desert of Paran. All, the, all of them were leaders of the Israelites. Verse 16, there are the names, these are the names of the men Moses sent to explore the land. It's all listed. And jo Moses gave to Hosea, son of Nun, the name Joshua. Did you catch that? Do you know what that means? Here's where you should study just a little bit more to be approved workman who rightly handles the word of cr truth. Hosea means salvation. Hosea is a son of Nun. That means fish or posterity. Hmm. Posterity is a future generation of people. Oh, if I fish for men instead of fish for the things of this world, look who's going to come and follow me into the promised land. People from every tribe, tongue, and nation saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Worthy is the Lamb. Because they see your faith and they follow you along the journey. And of course, he called him Joshua which means Jehovah saves. He is our salvation. Salvation comes, it is for all mankind to be a fisher of men, and it only comes from God's one and only Son, Jesus Christ. And if you know about 
scripture, we call him Jesus, but his name is the same as Joshua. It's Yeshua. That's how you would pronounce it. In Mark chapter 1, verse 16, as Jesus walked beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting their net in the lake, for they were fishermen. Come follow me, Jesus said, and I will send you out to fish for people. It's not something you do yourself. Jesus sends you out and he equips you all the way and he leads you all the way home. At once they left their nets and followed him. So there's a call to follow Jesus, but there has to be a response also, doesn't there? And they left everything behind. They did not look back and they followed Jesus. Peter would later say in Acts chapter 4, verse 12, Salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to men by which you must be saved. Is this what you believe? Do you understand the destination that you're going to? What is your destination? Are you fixed on that destination? How is your journey going? Do others see and are they going to follow you or are they going to label you as a hypocrite? Are you the blind leading the blind or are you living in light because Jesus is the light and he's shining through you and you're, people see your good deeds and glorify your Father which is in heaven? Is the light extinguishing the darkness? Are you experiencing gifts of the Spirit and are you using those gifts to serve the kingdom? James says that we fight and quarrel because we're jealous. And he says our prayers aren't answered because we pray for things we want rather than for things that God wants to use for His glory and for His honor. Maybe, like I said, it'd be better to live in the wilderness than to live in the land of plenty. But we'd be tempted no matter how we are. We've got to fix our eyes on Jesus. The journey matters because you will not reach your destination unless you journey on the right path. Many profess, but not many follow. How many Christians do you think say to themselves, I believe in Jesus Christ, but I won't enter heaven? I guarantee you no one who left the promised land said they would not enter into it. It's all about the destination, but it's also about the journey and how we get there and how we need to get rid of our adulterous loves and how we need to fix our eyes on Jesus, how we need to train up our children. And I could go on and on and on and read God's Word. Eat the bread of life and drink living water rather than worrying about what you're going to eat physically and what you're going to drink physically. This is a journey. In fact, it's a race that we all run together as the family of God brothers and sisters because we are children of the most high Paul wrote this to the church at Corinth also if we continue in chapter 10 now these things occurred as examples to keep us from setting our hearts on evil things as they did a fact of history do not be idolaters as some of them were as it was written the people sat down to eat and drink and got up to indulge in revelry we should not commit sexual immorality as some of them did. And in one day, 23,000 of them died. We should not test Christ as some of them did and were killed by snakes. And do not grumble as some of them did and were killed by the destroying angel. These things happened to them as examples and were written down to, as us for warnings on whom the culmination of the ages have come. So if you think you're standing firm, be careful that you do not fall back to numbers chapter 13 <clears throat> verse 23 when they reached the valley of Eskel they cut off a branch bearing a single cluster of grapes two of them carried it on a pole between them along with some pomegranates and figs that place was called the valley of Eskel because of the cluster of grapes that the Israelites cut off there at the end of 40 days they returned from exploring the land they came back to Moses and Aaron and the whole Israelite community at Kadesh in the desert of Paran there they reported to them and to the whole assembly and showed them the fruit of the land. They showed them the land of milk and honey. <clears throat> they gave Moses this account. We went into the land to which you sent us, and it does flow with milk and honey. Here is the fruit to prove it. But the people who live there are powerful, and their cities are fortified and very large. For We even saw descendants of Anak there, giants. The Amal Amalekites live in the Je, the Hittites, the Jebusites, and the Amorites live in the hill country, and the Canaanites live near the sea along the Jordan. 
But then Caleb silenced the people before Moses and said, We should go up and take possession of the land, for we can certainly do it. But the men who had gone up with him said, We can't attack those people. They are stronger than we are. Well, how big is your God? Come on. And they spread among the Israelites a bad report about the land they had explored. They said, The land we explored devours those, li devours those living in it. All the people we saw there are great size. They lied about the truth they had found because they feared, because they longingly looked back, because they served another other than God. We saw the Nephilim there, the descendants of Anak come, uh, come from Nephilim. We, we seem like grasshoppers in, in our own eyes and we look the same to them. That night all the members of the community raised their voices and wept aloud. All the Israelites grumbled against Moses and Aaron and the whole assembly said to them, If only we had died in Egypt or in the wilderness. Now what I'm going to tell you this plainly again. If you die, you're going to one destination or the other. And if you're not fixed on Jesus Christ and following Him, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth no matter what you think. Follow Jesus today. <clears throat> Why is the Lord bringing us to this land only to fall by the sword? Our wives and children will be taken as plunder. Would it be better for us to go back to Egypt? And they said to each other, we should choose a leader and go back to Egypt. Wow. Numbers 15 through 19, there are more holy standards, but there's more gumbling and there's more death. And there's more mercy and grace. And God holding on to His promise for those who want to accept it. And then in Numbers 20, you read about the water that is given for life. And you find out that Moses is not the one who can lead them into the, to their final resting place. It's Jesus Christ. 1 Corinthians 10, verse 2 through 5. They were all baptized in, into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. They all ate the same spiritual food, and they drank from the same spiritual rock, for they drank from the spiritual rock that accompanied them, and that rock was Christ. Nevertheless, God was not pleased with most of them, and their bodies were scattered in the wilderness. You may remember from John, you may not, through Jesus' life, and it, and it was in John 7... He was in Jerusalem, and it was the last and greatest day of the festival. Verse 37, Jesus stood up, and He said in a loud voice. It was amazing that He stood up. All eyes would have looked on Him because no one should have done that. And He said these words. He said, Let anyone who is thirsty come to Me and drink. Whoever believes in Me, as Scriptures has said, rivers of living water will flow from them. By this He meant His Spirit. Are living waters flowing from you because you drink from living water, which is Jesus Christ? Or do you grumble and complain and long for another meat and for another bread or for another water? Do you believe? Have you been baptized in the Spirit? Do you know the destination that you're going to? I said that I plainly knew that when I reached my destination, I would meet Jesus and I would see Buren. And the whole reason that I said that was to get other people to follow us in the journey. Yes, life is a journey. And if you want to be short of the, sure of the destination, then you live a life that shows it. James said, show me your faith without deeds. It's impossible. In Revelation 22, you got to the end of Revelation, you read these words. Then the angel showed me a river of the water of life as clear as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and from the Lamb. Down the middle of the main street of the city, on either side of the river, stood a tree of life bearing twelve kinds of fruits and yielding a fresh crop for each month. And the leaves of the trees are for the healing of the nations. No longer will there be any curse. The throne of God and the Lamb will be within the city and His servants will worship Him. They will see His face and His name will be on their foreheads. The Spirit and the Bride say, Come, let the one who hears say, Come, and let the one who is thirsty come and the one who desires the water of life drink freely. But in Numbers 20, as a result of their unbelief, the king of Edom runs them out from the promised land. And they spend 38 years wandering in the wilderness. What do you think they did? You don't have to tell me now, but I contemplate, what did they do? I know the things they had to do for daily sacrifices and everything, but I cannot fathom what that 38 years would be like because they rejected God's promise. I cannot even fathom it. And then if they didn't repent, because His whole purpose was to bring them repentance, what they would spend in eternity. I cannot fathom it. 
At the end of chapter 20, Moses doesn't enter the promised land. Aaron is dead. Who will lead the children home? We know the answer. We know his name, Yeshua, Jesus. We see all this in the book of Numbers, all this promise. Numbers 21, verse 4, they traveled from Mount Hor along the route to the Red Sea to go around Edom, but the people grew impatient on the way. They spoke against God and against Moses and said, Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? There is no bread. If only they could look at the spiritual things instead of the physical things. And there was bread and there was meat. There is no water. Yes, there was. And we detest this miserable food. You thought you just said there wasn't. You're not happy. You're not satisfied. You want to complain because God hasn't given you the life you want along the way. You complain when you crash, when you get off path, whatever it is, don't mumble and complain. Thank God. Rejoice in Him every single day for the life that He has given you and the life that He has redeemed you in Christ so that you will spend an eternity with Him. Then the Lord sent venomous snakes among them. They bit the people and many Israelites died. The people came to Moses and said, We sinned when we spoke against the Lord and against you. Pray that the Lord will take the snakes away from us. So Moses prayed for the people. The Lord said to Moses, Make a snake and put it on a pole. Anyone who is bitten can look at it and live. So Moses made a bronze snake and put it up on a pole. Then when anyone was bitten by a snake and looked at the bronze snake, they lived. Paul told the Corinthian church, we should not test Christ as some of them did and were killed by snakes. And Jesus said this in John 3 verse 13, No one has ever gone into heaven except the one who came from heaven, the Son of Man. Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up to pay the penalty for your sins once and for all, that everyone who believes may have eternal life. Go back to Numbers and fix your eyes on Jesus just like they fixed on that snake. Fix your eyes on Jesus going with the other heroes and heroines of faith, running this race because you know that your life's not your own and you live for another kingdom, another land. You're just passing through. Hebrews eleven seven. 7, I shared that verse with them. I've shared that verse with you because it's my motto verse. By faith, Noah, when warned about things not yet seen, he did not even understand them. In holy fear, that's why he did. He built an ark, but he did it for a reason, to save his family. And by his faith, because we're saved by faith, through, uh, grace through faith, by his faith he condemned the world. He set himself apart. He still lived in the world. He still did things. <clears throat> he condemned the world and he became an heir of righteousness that is in keeping with faith. So as we finish through that chapter and read the beginning of the next chapter, therefore since we're surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. Fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith, for the joy set before Him, He endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider Him who endured such opposition from sinners, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. Life is a gift, and I want anyone who hears me and sees me to know that that's their destination. So I've got to live the right journey along the way. Whatever I've got to give up, I don't want to be like the rich man who walked away from Jesus because he wasn't willing to sell the things that he had. Jesus hit him right where he knew he had to hit him. And he said, nope, I have another God before you. Do you have any that you need to get rid of? They're following you to one place or the other. I think about it every time I think about my son, my grandchildren. How can I live a life that brings glory and honor to God so that they reach their destination? And how can I do it without living this life on this journey? We talked about many of those times. Russell used to race four-wheelers. Russell, if you hear this, and we talked about good times like that. But I don't care what race four-wheelers were. I want to race to the kingdom. I mentioned Vance. I want you to be there. I mentioned, well, I didn't mention, but Matt rode street bikes, and we, we made many trips to road Atlanta, but I want you to make it there. I talked to him a bunch. He said he was confused on some things. Life is a gift. Use every second that you have for God's glory. I'm going to close with Philippians chapter 2, verses 1 through 16. 
Therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, any comfort from His love, if any common sharing in the Spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, any, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and one in mind. Do, not, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking out for your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Jesus Christ, who being in the very nature of God, did not consider equality with God something to be used of His advantage. Rather, He made Himself nothing. By taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the highest name that is above every other name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Therefore, my dear Friends, as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now much more in my absence, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you to will and to act in order to fulfill His good purpose. Do everything without grumbling or arguing, so that you may become blameless and pure, children of God without fault in a warped and crooked generation. Then you will shine among them like stars in the skies as you hold firmly to the words of life. Father in heaven, we do thank you and praise you. We thank you for the gifts of family, of marriage, of children, of grandchildren, of friends, of the things that we have in this world. Lord, help us not to, to idolize them, but to realize they are gifts from above that we cherish and that we be good stewards of. Lord, help us to realize we're not in the wilderness. We are as far as the foreign things, but we're in a land of, of plenty. Well, we're there simply because you've placed us there to be rich to others for the things that we have, not become complacent, not to, to seek other things, but to use the gifts that you've given us richly so that we can bring glory and honor to you to fight against things that are not right in this world, against human trafficking, against different wrongs, against whatever those things are, Lord. May we be a voice. May we be an action. May we be Jesus in our community and to the ends of the earth. Father, I just thank you and praise you for the finished work of Jesus Christ and know that he is interceding for us at the throne right now. And I just long for his return and for him to say, well done, my good and faithful servant. Bind us together, Lord, and help us to live as, the, as Jesus in the flesh here on earth as a church. We just thank you and praise you in the precious name of Jesus Christ. Amen.